Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Doug Kramer. He comes to us from the YouTube channel Dazed But Not Confused. So it's Dazed But Not Confused with a Z, C O N F U Z E D. And he's put up some excellent videos, very informative videos about his experiences in Scientology. And he has a long story to tell, a lot of very important information. I haven't heard from other Scientology critics, but he has firsthand information as somebody who was in the organization. So, Doug, are you there? I am, William, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to talk with you. Following you for a while, my friend. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate it. You know, the reason I came across your videos is uh, we were friends on Facebook, and uh, I had seen some of the videos, and then I, I started listening to them. I'm like, wow, this is really incredible. Uh, first person information. So I'm delighted that you're on the show. For people uh, who don't know of you, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you came to this decision to kind of put yourself out there and talk about Scientology? Sure. It's a long story, but I'll try to do it succinctly. So when I was around nine or 10, my dad got into Scientology in a single day. And basically what happened is he went away that day at work, my father, and he came back, I understand now, hypnotized. I don't know any other way to put it, because he was a different person when he got back this particular night, around 10 years old. Briefly, what happened is he saw a, um ad in the newspaper when he was at work that said, Dianetics, learn how to communicate better. He went down to the Ventura Mission in California that morning, and he ended up having his ruin found which means he was down there because he didn't really know how to communicate very well with me or the rest of the family. He was kind of an introvert, a good guy, but shy. And that was his button, as they say in Scientology, or what was ruining it. So <clears throat> Scientology is very good at getting to people's vulnerabilities. They found my dad's vulnerability that day. I don't know exactly what they sold him. I just know that he came back with the thousand yard stare in his eyes he wanted to borrow a large chunk of money from a family member because we didn't have a lot of money to suddenly do these courses. And when he did that for several, several months, it created a rift in the family because my mom didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And I didn't know what it was. And they were arguing for weeks straight over this. The way Scientology works is that once one family member gets into it, it has to be spread to the rest of the family like a virus. You don't necessarily have to become a Scientologist, but my dad was being trained, and any Scientologist is, on how to get other people in, and you're trained ruthlessly on how to do that. So my dad was having an agenda built into him while he was a Scientologist on how to get us into it. So my mom slowly got into it through my father saying, hey, before we get a divorce or you slam what Scientology is, why don't you come down and take a look at what it is before you make any drastic decision? I really love this. I found what I want to do, and this is really going to help me and our marriage and everything else out. So, of course, that's the hook to get her down here. She went through the same process of them finding her ruin, and eventually she got into it, mostly to keep the family together. I would think so. Obviously, I've never talked to my mom or parents about this, but I understand that my mom never really got into Scientology. She sort of did it because I think she felt that was a way to keep the family together. So once my mom got on board a couple years deep when my dad got into it, they would sit me down and double team me. I was a rebellious teenager, so I was always getting into problems. And their solution was we need to get our son on some basic courses in Scientology to help him because they're just trying to help me. And I rebelled all the time. Because I instinctually knew that Scientology was evil. I said in one of the videos that my dad's not evil, but whatever the heck happened to him was evil. There was like, the way I would describe it metaphorically, evil entered our family through my father. And I understand more about that on a much deeper level now. But it scared me. And I didn't know what was happening. And what, what when year I, around, what year was that for you that this whole uh, introduction or beginning with Scientology took place? I was born in July 1973, so if this happened when I was around 10, it'd be 83, 1983. Gotcha. So this was also, William, pre-exposure that Scientology has now, pre-being able to go on and Google out Xenu. I had no idea what he was in. Okay, so they would sit me down and double-team me every time I had a problem with a girlfriend or I was out ethics. That's Scientology's way of saying being a bad boy, doing something against your moral code. 
or societal's moral code. And then, so they would sit me down, have me go through this catharsis process, which we can get into later, but Scientology can get you to offload your burden. Any church can, right? It's like confession. So my parents were trained on how to do a version of confession to get me to talk, try to tell them the truth for about an hour, sometimes two hours. They would just sit there and listen and acknowledge me. And then at the end, they would tagline it with, Doug, we would like to offer you a course, a communication course or whatever. We believe this will help you. And rather than maybe getting punished, we could, you should, it was kind of a manipulative way to get me down to the org and the mission rather than maybe punishing me. So I would take them up on this just to appease them, just to get it over with. So that's how I got introduced. At 10, 11, 12, I had probably done the communication. That was the very first thing I did is um, OTTR0, which is on the communication course. Let me just explain real quick that night. The very first experience with time. Yeah. Okay, so there's there's a backstory up to there. And before I started rebelling, my first experience went like this. Doug. We're into the Scientology thing. We think it could help you. Okay, mom and dad, I didn't know what it was. Come down to the Ventura mission and let's do a course. So I didn't, I accepted it initially. I sat there and did, my man, it was just a very, very bizarre experience. The first thing I noticed about the mission is that the people were creepy Something was wrong with them. It's so obvious when you see a Scientologist before you go into the spell yourself. But even as a kid, it was pretty obvious that something was kind of wrong with these people. And there was something weird about them. Uh, In the terms of they all, I understand now, they all had their own ruin and their own insecurity, which was played on by Scientology to to the map. So they looked like freaky cultish members with dazed eyes the very first time I went down there. So uh, long story short, I end up doing OTTR0, which is where you close your eyes and you basically go into a meditation mode. It kind of calmed down my anger issues. I came into this world a very angry person, and it simultaneously freaked me out. And it also scared me that my parents were super dedicated um, at the time they got me down. Just to interject, just a sec, before you get into that, can you explain what a TR is? Some of Mm -hmm. these acronyms that Scientology uses so that the listener can understand these. But the training routines are very important to Scientology. Absolutely, they are. And my bad. Please jump in if I throw a term out there because I don't want to. Um, you know, throw a bunch of yeah, no worries. Things. It's okay. Sorry. The TR stand for training routines, and what they really are is hypnosis drills, and they're drills to slow down your critical thinking. But what you're told is that you're there to learn how to communicate better. So, in the communication course, they have on the first one four different training routines, and then they have another higher communication course called upper indoctrination. They actually use the word indoctrination, and that has another four or five training routines where you actually learn how to control a physical body and stuff, which is something my dad did um, a couple weeks into Scientology on me using these training routines that freaked me out. And I talked about that in one of the videos. So that's what the training routines are. And you're told, like I said, that you're simply learning how to basically meditate. The whole point of that OTTR zero, where you sit there with your eyes closed about two feet apart from another person the whole idea, you do this for weeks and hours and hours and weeks and weeks on end until you can finally be there comfortably, William. When I passed it, I felt like I didn't have any thoughts in my mind. My mind was kind of numb. I was kind of in an altered state. My butt wasn't on fire. I wasn't um, moving around. Um, I could finally just be there because they numbed me out. It's excruciating to sit there. My first experience, I remember I can't stand sitting here with my eyes closed, focusing my, it, it drives you actually mad. So and somebody's I, watching you too, right? I mean, didn't you say that there yeah. was like somebody said fail, restart or something like that? So you had to kind of keep yeah. going like you had a kind of referee. Exactly. Particularly in the OTTR zero, because the next one that you do, William, is TR zero, where you both have your eyes open and you're always twinned up with another person. That's actually part of the mind control on a deeper level. But we'll get into, we can talk about that later. The twinning up is where you start. So yes, you have a supervisor watching over you and coaching you, particularly when you have your eyes closed because you can't, one person is the coach, William, and then one person is a student, and then you switch back and forth. So you don't have to always have a supervisor, you know, guiding you through it. It's also a way to save money and and make a lot more money. 
Right. So real briefly um, with that supervisor thing, yes, he was sitting there coaching me. I, I couldn't, um, sometimes I would be told that I to stop and flunk because I was twitching and all that. I mean, I'm 10 years old, William. I, I had a, um, a very, a uh, lot of energy running through me anyway. It's kind of some anger issues. So to sit there, and to do what they have you do is absolutely brutal, you know, no matter your age. So that that's the very first one. The second one, like I said, you do a staring contest with another person and on and on it goes. So that's my first introduction to Scientology. Now, when I started getting used to it and getting more creeped out by it, and I couldn't stand going through these training routines. It was like punishment. It was like going to something that you don't want to do that your parents make you do. I also pretended that I was having wins a little bit because I wanted my parents to kind of like, I wanted to do what they approved of. So a part of me was just saying, yeah, I'm totally into this. And I was convincing myself and getting some things out of it. It's not all evil and bad because you are meditating, but the mind control and, and the, it's a suggestive state that you're constantly kept in can be really damaging. I started to finally reject this around 12 or 13 or 14 when I started to figure out what it was and their double teaming tactics became more like um, more manipulative because they were getting more training. The church trains every family member how to manipulate the rest of the family members into it while pretending that you're not doing that and they're experts at it. So they figured out ways to manipulate me down there um, to continue doing this even though I hated it more and more eventually William it came to the point where this was such a routine and they would sit me down and as soon as they would tagline the end of me babbling about yeah I did this that and that wrong they would say Doug we just want to suggest that you go down to science and as soon as they would get the s word out of Scientology I'm not going to swear here but I said the f word to my parents very strongly many times and I would slam the door when I didn't have a car, I would just walk down the block. And when I did have a car, as I got older, I would drive off really, really heated. So that's basically how it went through. Well, I was a normal kid going to school and doing all the other things everybody else does. Periodically, I was going to the Ventura Mission and to the Santa Barbara Org to be a guinea pig for my dad while he was doing his training, as well as doing my own courses. So while I rejected it, seed by seed, it was going in. Right. So you're constantly being exposed to these ideas in your kind of personal family life. And your parents are still in Scientology. Is that correct? Not only that, my dad is at the top of the bridge. He's an OT8. And he's been an OT8 for at least 15 years now. So he's okay. super, super dedicated. For him to leave Scientology would be impossible, I feel, because it's his identity. He needs it. And you know, maybe some people do, even though it's the greatest evil, maybe some people do need a structure because I feel my dad would break at, if that ever got removed from him. I um, think that, that happens story. in all churches or all religions sure. is people. Part of it is the structure. Part of it mm -hmm. is the ability to just have somebody tell you what the right way is. I think a lot of people totally. And that's, that, that is what I liked about Scientology as well. And I just talked about that in the latest video. When I finally did get into it, William, it was the structure, the tools that they have. They had information on targets and goals, how to communicate better. They have an answer and a technology to do everything. That's super, super appealing. And also they sell certainty. That's the major word in Scientology. And the button, a button in Scientology, according to L. Ron Hubbard, is a word or an idea that a person has that you can grab onto in order to manipulate them or suck them into you. So certainty is a button that the human race has that Ron Hubbard figured out. And basically people want to know what the heck, a framework from which to live their life so they can go forward and not have to question everything every two seconds. And they have a very well laid out, especially at the beginning, program to be able to structure your life how you want it. Right. And that's the bridge that you show a picture of. The bridge to total freedom, you use the term, the bridge to total amnesia. But it, the bridge is actually a very detailed stepping stone that I think you liken to the grades of masonry. It probably is similar to the OTO. But, That's all the same. But you're going up this grade. It's a much longer process and much more expensive than maybe some other secret societies. But It is. Uh, and that's probably the only difference. Right. So, yeah. I mean, what did Hubbard famously said? The way to make money is to start a religion. So uh, that's there. But um, so that's another process. So you've got this game. And I think also if you want to talk about the structure of Scientology, 
there's definite hierarchies that you maybe you'll see in the Catholic Church, hyper hierarchical system. But in Scientology, the guy who's OT5 is better than the guy who's OT4, who's better than the guy OT3, right? So isn't there kind of this case kind of system in Scientology? Massively. And you're just bringing up so much stuff just by reminding me of that. I can't believe I used to think that way, William. Like it's, it's like this way for most of Scientologists. So I think I could speak for him when I say, I didn't even want to date a girl. When I got up to the, the OT levels and the OT levels for the audience are the confidential levels that you have to pay a lot of money and go through about 10 years of brainwashing to finally get up to. And they're the ones that really split your mind and cause you to go insane. When I was going up the OT levels, I didn't even want to date. And it was kind of, this is the way it is in Scientology. You don't want to date somebody on a lesser case level. So if they were at grade four, which is quite a bit down from OT3, which is a level I got out where I finally lost my mind and started to wake up. Um, you definitely have a whole narcissistic, arrogant, I'm more superior than you. And that played out in a big, big way with my father because I believed that as a child. So I knew he was going into the room while I'm sitting there being a lazy kid on the couch watching television. And I knew he was doing, I didn't know what the OT levels were, but I knew he was doing spiritual technology where he could read minds. So I felt like while he was in the room getting rid of body things, I didn't know that, but I knew he's doing serious Scientology stuff because he'd always come home, lock the door and, and do Scientology 24 seven after working like almost every night. So I used to always be afraid of my dad because I knew he could read my mind and I knew he knew what my crimes were. And that's part of the reason why I was willing to do Scientology eventually, because I also felt like their e-meter, which is their cheesy little half of a lie detector. Vector and, and all that. We can get into that later. But I also believed in that, that that could get things out of me, mostly because my dad scared the crap out of me, but I knew I couldn't withhold anything from him. So I might as well just tell the truth while I'm at Scientology as much as I can. And that was super uncomfortable because while you don't want to lie, there are certain boundaries that I realized that they absolutely smash in Scientology, but you need to have. And those were initially eradicated by that very point that you just made. Everything's hierarchical, everything's structured, and, and it's taken to the nth degree where if you're at the bottom of the bridge and your father or friend or associate is an OT and you know anything about Scientology and you believe in it, it gives a really scary dominance factor over you. I didn't even realize that until you were talking about that, but my, that's how I, that's definitely part of the reason how I got into it. My dad scared me in, into, I need to tell all, and that's a major phrase in Scientology auditing. Have need to, to tell always, all so you have to like disclose yes. everything well it's what it's all about because as you know when you eat that's all the blackmail material that they're going to use against you and they can get you to say things that you wouldn't tell to a, your deepest spouse or relative that's why my dad whatever his ruin was that they found it's sort of a secret maybe even to this day from my mom and me and everybody else is the way that works and scientology has done this to many people is you can kind of keep a secret with scientology fix it there and not have to actually say it to your spouse or friend. And then the spouse or friend, my mother in this example, right? She also didn't have to say too much to my dad. Everything's handled through a third party or a via through auditing. Hey, I fixed it in auditing. Therefore, don't question me on it. That's the way the whole dynamic works. Fascinating. So then they have this information on you in a folder right from the beginning, right? Right when they're right getting all that stuff. And you, re- yeah, and you repeat this term ruin which it's such an obvious negative connotation. So they find that one thing that you had. And I think in your videos, sexuality was also a big obsession with Hubbard and Scientology. And so they would try, you know, they could cure Scientology claims to almost cure anything. So that was a big draw for certain people. If they go up the scale to OT, whatever they can overcome anything, anything, anything. If you're a homosexual, they'll subtly promise that they can remove that. If literally any problem that you have, William, will be handled. I mean, my main goal, my main ambition, a little bit corny now using Scientology auditing and all the training to do this, is I wanted to be an actor. So that was the hook that they got me into. And as you know, it's a big thing, especially out here in LA, to grab young hopefuls that are trying to make it, give them a structured way, kind of guarantee that they have a way into the business. You talked about Masterson in one of your videos Mm -hmm. who was a beneficiary of the Scientology system. Cruz, we know of Travolta, Romini. There's a lot of Scientology, a lot of, and to, Hubbard deliberately targeted celebrities to give him the cachet that Scientology was, you know, it was kind of an, uh, a selling point for the whole thing. Like you can hang out with celebrities or whatever. 
definitely. He has a whole policy, William, on how to capture celebrities and why they're important. And by the way, some somebody might ask, if he's telling you this stuff, if he's using the word ruin, if he's using these words like raw meat to, def- to define people that are newbies, he, if he's calling people terminals rather than human beings, this is some of the nomenclature they use, why on earth would you ever join Scientology? Before you're kind of hit with that, and first of all, they don't tell you that they're finding your ruin. They say they're there to help you. That's the stuff that you learn about later when you learn how to manipulate people after you're already into it. So you're not really getting hit with all this crazy stuff, which would be red flags right away. It's only after you subtly get brainwashed, you start to then want to save the world too. And so it's not bad to call someone raw meat because you start to look down on them. They have a reactive mind, which you're getting rid of. You know they need to get rid of it. So there's the flip that starts and the judgment where you start accepting these words because it's for the greater good. It's another huge concept in Scientology, which I just talked about in this last video, if I can ever upload it. They, um, they, they have a phrase where whenever you make a decision in life, you always have to do the one that is the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. Briefly, the dynamics are the eight areas that a Scientologist or any human being naturally has an urge to survive in. The first dynamic urge to survive through self, second dynamic urge to survive through family, through groups, etc., all the way up to the urge to survive through God and infinity. So whenever you make a decision as a Scientologist, and you start to get brainwashed, these words don't affect you because you're doing the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. And the greatest good is to sell Scientology to the rest of the world, get rid of everybody's reactive mind so we can have a calm, non-stimulated planet. So once you buy into that, which you're led into subtly, all of these other words that people might go, I would never accept that. That's They call you raw meat. Not People don't understand that you do a switch at a certain point you don't realize that's happening in your own consciousness, in your own personality. It's a very weird process, William, to go through and then come out of it. It's very strange because you don't actually see it happening because it's boiling a frog in hot water, slow step by slow step by slow step. Yeah, and I think you mentioned in your videos the first introductions, they don't hit you with everything. Everything seems to be for your benefit. These are our techniques where you can you know, become a better person, be smarter, yes. whatever it is be more secure. I mean, and that's like the whole introductory. You talked about this personality test, the Ox, these so-called quote Oxford personality <laughs> test that has nothing yeah, to do Oxford. with Oxford, but you're always, and you see this, I live in LA. So you always see these guys walking around the street in Hollywood. Hey, you want to take a personality test? But they always kind of find some issue with you, whatever it is. You're not, you're not going to ace this Scientology personality test. It's rigged not to. And when you're learned and trained how to do it, I'm going to do a separate video on that. The rigging of it's quite interesting. You know, what you just said is in a nutshell, you can't pass it. They're going to find um, it's a little more sophisticated than rue stones or throwing the bones or, or trying to do psychic readings as some new age, you know, uh, con artist. It's a little more accurate than that. But it's basically everybody has a vulnerability. And if you throw out 10 of 10 vulnerabilities, you're going to get somebody's eventually. It's just like, you know, L, to, in a nutshell, L. Ron Hubbard is what I'd call a psychopath, a sociopath, whatever you want to say. He didn't have a conscience. And I got very close to that myself. But luckily, I was born with a conscience. I came to find out later. So I got as close as you can get to maybe L. Ron's or a sociopath's mindset. Because when you don't have a conscience, the idea of like all of these things that we're talking about, we're going to talk about, looking down on people, calling them Rami, learning how to manipulate people in such a sophisticated way who would ever do that trying to take over the world all these crazy things that you and i would never think about people like him that don't have a conscience can become experts in areas that i had to learn the hard way i mean this you know not to get off on a tangent but l ron hubbard waking up scientology david miscavige sociopaths this was all really really shocking information for me to learn about because one i knew nothing about See, I didn't know there was people in this world that wake up every day saying, how can I take over the world and this person a little bit more? It's just, right. it's still That's a concept a that blows my mind. And that was kind of one of the themes in your videos is also like, they don't teach you this in school. And I think that that's actually a shortcoming of whatever scholastic system, because they're leaving out these kind of coercive social programming. 
Yeah, things unconscious. that are really everywhere. The unconscious or the even advertising Absolutely. or politics. Yeah. It's everywhere, brother. That's yeah. That was one of the things that I said in the video why it was so irritating. Obviously, I know why they don't teach it in school because you're not there really to keep critical thinking. You're there to teach a person to be a, a drone in a nine-to-five machine. You don't want them thinking too much. You want them doing their job, shutting up, right. and just basically serving the system. But because Which is I came really out of scary. A, yeah. It's actually really Dude, scary it because it's similar to Scientology. I hate to say it. As somebody who went through the public school system, but... I just said that again in my last video. I wanted, yeah. I knew what I wanted to do as a kid. I knew I was an artist, uh, basically out of the womb. I took one look at the, at the system and said, that's not for me. And so I, I, most of my conflict, and I think why I fell into Scientology, was basically having a pretty strong idea of what I wanted to do as a kid. And I, I didn't even know why I had to go through high school. I wanted to move out to Los Angeles and do that right away. And, of course, William, the education system, that's a misnomer. It's a it's an indoctrination system. It's not there to educate you. And that was one of the things that made me go so deep into this. And maybe where I got to where I'm at now, where I'm like, want to speak out about this and maybe warn people because um, I had a lot more trust in the world and the system. And that was broken and shattered, not just with L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology, but wow, look at what we do to our kids. Look at what we do to people. We, I can't, I still can't understand this and maybe I'm just weird, but I know you, you think this way. I don't understand why this hasn't been licked a long time ago. Who or why are we allowing, are we harming our children because and dumbing them down because all we're doing is setting up uh, a, a reality that's guaranteed to, to not be good. Right. I mean, we should be teaching people everything we know. We should be teaching them about how the mind, the subconscious works. That That's so important. It's I don't even know where to start. But, of course, we're not going to be taught that because then we'd be able to take our power back. We'd be able to right. own it's our It's about own power. Minds. I think it's about power. Yeah. Right? So the, the it's all controllers and the New World Order – and exactly. And they, they've been working on yeah. this for a long, long time, yes, man. Yeah, While we've yeah. been going to jobs and keeping our heads down, yeah. they may be psychopaths. And L. Ron Hubbard, I may hate him, but I do have a certain, I don't even know what word you'd call it, but I like studying him. And he's become a fascination. I never met him. A guy I never met took over and ruined and completely destroyed my entire life and family and my mind and my reality. And I never met him. One of the first revelations I had is if that's possible, this must be happening through the mind. Right. So that yeah. led down a lot of rabbit holes and a lot of, I can't believe that this is happening on a much bigger scale well, than Scientology. And where, where's the, the rescue team? Where's the Right. Like, like, where is it? No. And the thing is, is that anybody who really criticized Scientology, at least in the eighties or seventies, they were destroyed. I've seen some of the internal oh, documents know. of Scientology and it functioned like the CIA or something where they would just not like the CIA. Okay. Okay. Well, they, well, to put it, to put it without getting too deep into it, the CIA themselves said that Scientology CIA operation, when they got caught through operation snow white was more sophisticated than the U S's own CIA operation. So what does that tell you? Plus, and didn't you say like one of the, one of the things he used Q bark or whatever was a yeah. term for the CIA. So they're using yeah. kind of CIA manuals very sophisticated stuff. It's really scary to think that people were not warned. Like, I'm just sure that you are not alone in that experience of like, who is this real person? Because Hubbard put out this whole thing. Like he was in a, he was crippled or whatever from the war and he saved himself through Scientology and he was traveling the world. And he just had this real, this biography was just like one of his novels. It was all fake. And at a certain point, these people start waking up like, they didn't get all the information about what it really was really about until they got in, right? And then they're right. like, hold on, what's this story? Who's Zenu? What's this? There's so much. There's so, and who was involved in black magic? Who's Aleister Crowley? Why is this person important? Yeah, man. I so, mean, can you, William, I got to tell you on that line, here I am totally believing in Scientology. It's, just, it's your typical predator. There's no difference between being in a relationship and an abusive relationship with L. Ron Hubbard David Miscavige in Scientology and being in an abusive relationship with a narcissist or a sociopath. It's the same thing, same dynamics. It's just interesting that it's on a, it plays out on a global scale with Scientology uh, and a cult. Uh, and then it plays in a family dynamic 
Because, you know, I would say that Scientology makes you into a narcissist and a sociopath over time, whether you like it or not. That's I said in one of the videos, it's a, it's a sociopath making machine. It's designed on purpose to shut down your emotions, to shut down your critical thinking, and to shut down your conscience so that you can do the unthinkable. The, there's been a huge debate, by the way. I hate it when people say you can't hypnotize somebody and make them do something against their own moral code. I can tell you absolutely you can. And the people that put out that information about dismissing hypnotists, it's not even a real subject. You can never make somebody do something against their moral code under hypnosis. The Manchurian candidates, an overplayed movie, you can't actually make somebody do the bidding and go murder someone. Not only can you make them do that, these tools have been around forever and people are doing that. And it's like, I can't believe that this isn't more, I understand why not because of the control itself, but it should be a more universal subject that we start talking about. And as you know, William, the times we're living in, I think it is coming more out on the table because of what people right. like you do. And, you know, a lot of other people that are now getting into this, like me, you've been doing this forever. I jumped into this because of the very shock of finding out that the point I wanted to say was I believed in Scientology. I, I might not have been the greatest person. I had my flaws, but I didn't have any reason to doubt that the auditing wasn't real and these courses. I trusted Hubbard. No doubting whatsoever. Right. So when I found out what I was involved in, which is a separate story, and I'm finding out he's into black magic and this kind of stuff, I'm like, what the heck is going on? Right, that's the real story. I was well, hit with all this right away. But, and not only that, I said. Like, I didn't just dismiss it as I don't necessarily believe in black magic like Hubbard does, but I recognize there must be something to this because it was so bizarre. Like it was so out of left field. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I spent years just finding out who this guy was and what he was into and man, what he's into and who he is versus what you think he is and what he's into when you're a Scientologist are so two completely different worlds. Right. But I'm thinking I'm never going to be able to get my parents out. Because there's this huge gap that you have to cross. It's super traumatizing, super shocking. Yeah. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that mankind's greatest friend is a Satanist. You know? Right. No, it's a difficult question. And I think it's really interesting. Like there was some some audio that you included. It was part 5.5, Bridge mm -hmm. to Total Amnesia, where Hubbard is like talking about some hypnotism at a very high level. He, and he wants to yeah. look. He's looking for the unconscious mind. Like he yeah. admits to all this and you and I kind of chuckled or chortled about it earlier, but like he had really, and he said very, very potent axioms or statements. Like I'm looking to something to take the place of the will. So he's right in yes. the same thing with, when you're talking about human will, you're talking about the same thing, Manchurian candidate, but I think yeah, Hubbard probably. has to be seen. Yeah, true. But I, I'm looking at, at Hubbard more and more in the context of people like Jolly and West and, Gottlieb and these other mm -hmm. guys who were involved in the same kind of mind control experiments right alongside Hubbard, literally going down the same river at the same time, um, trying to crack the human brain. And I, if you look at this O'Neill book, uh, Operation Chaos is called Chaos, but mm -hmm. it's really about Operation Chaos. But they, I mean, one of the things O'Neill really proved is that Gottlieb and Wes were in conversation with each other under pseudonyms. So these guys are all communicating with each other in ways that we may never really ever know. Like he just uncovered this and now it's 2020, right? These guys are right, right. taking around. So the thing is, my point is, is that they had, once they cracked the ability to hypnotize somebody and make them operate against their will, they had to cover that up by lying about it. So then exactly. they mocked everybody, called you a conspiracy theorist. Bro, and that's really about the 60s. So you're talking about yeah, Sirhan man. Sirhan. Yes. The Manson family. Oh, Dude, Manson had the Scientology. He was at the top of Scientology. He knew all the control yeah. mechanisms. But I think it's important to kind of like break up the story to put Hubbard in context of what really was at the highest end. And he was a hypnot he was a doctorate in hypnotism. He knew everything. You said it, you just said everything. Um to point the stress on what you just said, what you said so much good stuff there, man. Yeah, he was really, really well trained in the occult and hypnotism just like all these other people. In that video you mentioned, he says Hubbard himself was in a lecture saying this hypnotism has been used by witch doctors, right. You know, basically going all the way back. He absolutely knew what he was doing and didn't really have a problem mocking and 
having fun with his hypnotized subjects. He was telling them that he was hypnotizing them. Even in that video that I put on one of the videos, he's talking about how psychoanalysis, which he hated and was in competition with, of course, because that would take away his business and they wanted to, you know, they right. knew what he was up to. He would say, um, psychoanalysis hypnotizes people. They're the ones that make you dependent on them. And they're the ones that are doing this well. And while he's doing that, he's snapping his freaking fingers, dude. He's literally hypnotizing the people he was talking to you back in the 50s or 60s when this lecture was doing wow. and kind of tackling you know he's got the sociopathic smirk on the entire time i can yeah. imagine watching him just do these people and because he was an expert in these subjects mm -hmm. and like you said not only are we not taught these subjects in school they're they're being used against us in school and everywhere else for god's sakes and it's like mm -hmm. that's why it was such a shock to realize the depth of effort and tenacity that goes into and a long history of how to actually control people's perceptions and what, as Dr. Robert Oppenheimer says, a man believes to be true. Because if you can get that, you control behavior, emotion, you control a whole person's life if you control the information that people receive. It's as simple well, as that. These guys are experts too. Right. But I'm glad that you brought up Oppenheimer because I almost like fell out of my chair when he stated that this mind control stuff was as more important, if not more important than the against as a weapon against humanity than the atom bomb. This is the guy who it, created that was a, you know, pro Manhattan project central exactly. figure saying, Hey, you got to watch out for these techniques. This guy's a very smart person and uh, really incredible, you know, incredible statement for somebody who knew that the devastation of the atom bomb to say that, right. I think you said no, it was man. in 1952 or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, um, and not only that, we were warned by Huxley. We were warned by, I mean, he was kind of part of it, but, uh, you know, we were warned by Orwell. We've been warned by so many people, sometimes the very people that were doing this to people, trying to control them through the mind. It's That's not a like great statement. I, I like hard. the Orwell statement because you use in your videos that some of these rooms where you're going in there with an auditor is like room 101 yeah. from all. It's not like it. It yeah. is it. You know, I, I would go so far as to say, I know you know about this, and I'm sure your listeners will, you know, are up to speed. I would say that Scientology is actually just a continuation of Project MK Ultra. As we talked about, they, you know, all these connections that you mentioned earlier, and then, you know, Hubbard really did receive the same text that Hitler did as a young boy. It all interconnects. You made some really, really good connections in that last conversation which basically summed up everything that I'm going to get across in these series, hopefully, with documented evidence and facts, because I don't think it's really been covered totally. And how else can you solve the problem if you don't know what you're actually dealing with? So all of these connections that you're making, things don't exist in isolation. There right. is like a pattern of what we're looking at. Right. And I think if we can sort of dissect that, which is what you know, guys like you do, and I'm trying to do, then maybe we can start to maybe wake people up to like what's happening that they might not be aware of. You know? right. That's what happened to me, man. This whole right. thing, this whole experience, it's not just about Scientology. It was waking up to kind of a, a bigger um, reality of how things kind of work. And it shocked me to my core. I'm still getting over it 12 and a half years later. I still can't wrap my mind around people. But don't you this. think that's the same with everybody who comes out of Scientology is that they either have some type of PTSD to a greater Definitely. or lesser extent? Yeah. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Especially if you, some people might take a few courses, William, and even then it can actually do some long-term damage just if you do the TRs, the communication course for a couple of weeks. But you can go in and it depends on the person you are. And, you know, I had a girlfriend that was in it for a few years. She just got out and moved on. So it's not everybody, but it can, generally speaking, you're absolutely guaranteed to have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what I had. I didn't need to be diagnosed. I knew that because I was learning about this. Um, but isn't absolutely... there like a strong kind of anti-apostate view within Scientology as well? Like you're not supposed to leave or whatever? I said it in a previous video, and this is like any cult. It's like the Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave, meaning you can leave it physically, but until you leave it mentally, it will own you. And that's why, like, Marty Rathburn and stuff and other people, you can be maybe bought off, drawn back, compromise your desire to fight Scientology or expose them. 
Once they have you, especially my man, if you've been in the Sea Org, if you've been into it for most of your life, imagine being a kid. I think Rinder was born into it. Imagine being a kid. That's what you know most of your life. Can you imagine, man? That's why I got up easy and I didn't want to kill myself. I'm lucky I made it through it. So I do admire a lot of these people that, I mean, I just can't imagine this the PTSD that they might have for the rest of their lives. But the harassment, also, yeah. Like, what is oh, it? Yeah. Jerry Armstrong, I talked to Jerry Armstrong. Yeah. If people want to listen to that interview, it's under William Ramsey Investigates. But he was there, and, like, he endured all kinds of harassment. That guy's right? been through hell and hell. Hell, hell. Alive, Su- oh. hell that's, that's a real... A He's real a warrior, person. man, because he got sued he and took everything. Yeah, like, there's really a few... Yeah, man. Actually, there's more than a few. How many people died or gave their life or like the Armstrongs of the world? I mean, there's some real freaking heroes, man. Yeah. And, and you like, like dedicated uh, one of your videos to Arnie Lerma. Who, yeah. yeah, it might be controversial what happened to him at the end. And I don't want to get into that. Yeah. But I he was, was just fighter, getting, though. He was fighting. He, he was he was a. I don't know much about him. I was just befriending him on Facebook. He taught me so much of what I know. That guy took a lot of heat because he was a he was a deep thinker he's very intelligent and from what i understand he was a pretty decent person but when you're going up against what he up went and an armstrong and all these people i have a lot of um i didn't know arnie but i have a lot of respect for him because of what he taught me and i know the heat and the life that he must have lived being one of the pioneers because we owe a lot to the pioneers it's a lot easier to talk out about scientology but what arnie and armstrong yeah. all cooper so many other people had their lives i mean they were lucky to live through it right. let alone coming out like these people have but there so were this is pre-internet so there were huge yeah, yeah complaints about them. leaking documents yeah. scientology could do so much more then than they can do now. They're still ruthless. Don't get me wrong. They have they they still need to be, you know, handled as they would say. They were absolutely able to. Oh man, and this is where you get into the criminal stuff, man. This is where you get into the off record and the off book stuff. Hmm, did they murder people? What, what what was it really a suicide or was it? I mean, they were able to get away with literally murder and maybe still are up to this day. But particularly pre-internet, they could smash people. And all you have to do is ask Jerry Armstrong or Arnie Lerma or a number of other people that will verify, man, it's so much easier to talk out about today, although they're still ruthless. And I don't, sometimes I don't even know if like those guys are given credit because some of those people like Arnie and Jerry, they might be looked upon as, let's say, the more celebrity figures they might not want to talk to people that controversial. And part of the reason it motivated me to get off my butt and get off the couch and jump on here is because there's a lot to say that I learned from these people and they don't get to kind of say what needs to be said. So it seemed yeah. like there's a whole. No, well, that was interesting. Of, uh, it's interesting that you bring that up because that was one of the things Jerry and I kind of mentioned is like mm-hmm. Joe Rogan is talking to Leah Romini, this kind of, you know, personality yeah. who's been on TV and not talking to somebody who was really there, like on the boat with Hubbard, who'd mm-hmm. seen everything firsthand. Right, like, right. Why aren't right. you getting and this I, guy who's willing to yeah. talk about everything? It's pretty interesting. Who knows, right? And I don't want to knock Leah Remedy because, you know, one of the things that she did for me personally, and I know this must have been for other ex Scientologists, when, when that show came out, and also Going Clear and a lot of other people, but, you know, I, I do have an issue with the level that they'll go to. I feel like they kind of stay within a certain bubble and they're not allowed to go beyond that, maybe for certain reasons. But the level of exposure, the average person that that show gave, where I didn't have to babble to my friends every day, I would talk about Scientology, trying to get it out and deprogram it. It was what I needed to talk about it. People didn't want to hear me keep rambling and I even ramble about it to this day. But that show saved me so much effort gave so much more awareness about, hey, it's not just a creepy UFO cult. They jack people up. So kudos to her and Rinder, maybe, for having the balls. and Because it does take courage to get out take there courage, yes. and do what these people did. I mean, I, I haven't done anything. So I can sit here and knock them and nitpick or whatever. But they've done it. And the courage that it takes, the exposure that they've given, I might want to take it to a a different level. Jerry Armstrong should be able to speak. 
Arnie should have gotten, in my opinion. These are people we need to listen to. But, um, you know, we're also talking about Hollywood here too, William, and that's a whole other scene that kind of interjects with my whole Scientology experience. So there are network constraints. There's a whole bunch of stuff that people wouldn't understand. So who knows, right? But, you know, kudos to anybody that's getting out there and exposing it because it all, we should be one group working together. And there's a lot of infighting, by the way, my man, within the ex-Scientology community. I won't be invited. I'm not really a part of a whole lot of them except for Arnie's group, Scientology deprogramming and stuff. But um, there's a lot of just drama. So I'll probably never be invited or whatever. I don't really care. I'm, that's not why I'm doing this. I'm just saying one of the reasons I got off the couch is because, like, can we talk about the whole picture here? Because we're right. never going to crack this thing if we don't go to the core of what it is. And there can't be any off-limits areas about what we need to talk about, you know? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because you do include in your videos the son of L. Ron Hubbard, Ron DeWolf, somebody who yeah. I covered a lot in Children of the Beast. Very important man. Yeah, yeah. so maybe you can talk about some of his his first-person accounts. I mean, he you probably know more about him than me because I think you got a manual for him. Or like well, his student. autobiography. He, he made yeah. an autobiography, which was before the Internet, so you couldn't really self-publish. But I have to dig it up I out really of my way. I, I have that I stuff that's that. included in that where he's talking about his dad fondling – Crowley materials before lectures and Crowley actually there is a recording of Hubbard talking about Crowley in a very knowledgeable sense to the magicians 12th and 13th century yes OTO it goes up and a very interesting man Alistair Crowley the beast six at the very end yeah Yeah, so that's a lecture by the way from the PDC which stands for the Philadelphia doctor course I think it's lecture number one I could be wrong endless lectures He's getting blown out of his mind in the early 50s by Crowley material. He doesn't tell you that, but that's all the crap that he's putting out in the Philadelphia doctor course. Mm-hmm. Right at the end, I believe, of lecture one, when he's talking about those cults in the 12th and the 13th century and blah, blah, blah. Right at the very end, he says something along the lines of, he's talking about the Prince of Darkness. And then he says to the audience, who do you think I am? And he laughs and cackles. This is a, He's putting wow. another one over on him. He's basically coming right out and saying, yeah, I'm Satan. You guys just don't realize it. And he's laughing throughout the entire way. So I can just see him fondling. Does that audio exist? Because I never heard, I saw, and I only had a snippet of that. Yeah, you would be able to, whoever had the PDC lectures, I don't think you'd be able to, remember back in the day before the internet censorship when I was waking up, you could get all of these audio files and everything. I, now I look for this stuff on the internet. It's almost impossible to find. The time to have woken up was right the time when I did because you can't find any of this stuff but wow, anybody that's amazing. who's a Scientologist or whatever, they had the PDC lectures and it would be in there. But who knows if David Miscavige didn't edit that part out because he's edited a lot of stuff out, hence the repackaging the materials to make more money. Um, he edited a lot of stuff out, not least the OT8 document where Hubbard says he's Lucifer the Lightbringer. He just flat out says it. I'm here to, you know, prevent the second coming. I'm actually uh, Lucifer the Lightbringer. It's this really cryptic and coded um, occultic document where he's finally confessing who he really is. Um, because as you and I talked about earlier, when Crowley died in 47, he didn't just believe that he was like taking over the position and the mantle of the beach from Crowley. He thought he was Satan himself, such as the narcissist he actually was. I mean, he took narcissism to another level, man. This is like saying that you're God, except he was proud and really believed, I believe to his core, that he was the man, you know, the red man, if you know what I mean. Right. No doubt. I don't think there's any doubt. And I, the interesting thing about Hubbard is that he came across a copy of the Book of the Law in D.C. when he was 14. Very interesting. Went through Agape Lodge, Pasadena. Mm-hmm. I just did a recent show. My last show was actually about Forrest Ackerman, who was his literary agent. That was a great show, oh, by thanks, the way. Man. I learned I so much from you guys, man. Yeah. That, I mean, I didn't when you know- think you know it all, you guys bust out this material. Hey, man, and then you see all those connections through the occult through Ackerman, not just the comic book Ackerman. stuff and Marvel, but Parsons, LeVay, Hubbard. It's incredible. And these guys, it when is. did they do the Babylon working? They were trying to bring magic into the world after the war, and then Hubbard starts off, and there's a, there's a line within the Book of the Law that says there shall be one that comes after. So every occultist who thinks he's somebody, they think they're the one who comes after, and I think Hubbard thought he was one who come after and there are other yeah. people who want to take this mantle of the beast, so to speak. Think of the competition. I'm sure there was like a thousand other people in this world at the time that also thought they were Lucifer. 
just like in Scientology auditing, by the way, everybody, once we go past life, we all think we're, we're some famous person in the last life. And so there's right. 20 Marilyn Monroe's running around in Scientology that think that's who they were. I'm not kidding. No, I, I no. the past life regression cruelly called it magical memory. So yeah. this whole thing yeah. about you can reach your past life goes through. Exactly what auditing is, by is. the way. Holding right. straight from Crowley. Really flattering thing. Like you're Napoleon. You're never like a peasant. Uh, you know, digging for mushrooms in France in the 11th yeah. century or something. What would be wrong with that? I mean, uh, nothing. I'm just saying, like, it's all sort no, of I, the I narcissism. I'm just saying, like, everybody wants to be somebody important. Maybe right. just try to, you know, be a good person first before you try to be, you know, Jesus last life or something. One of the things <laughs> that you, you read off in one of your videos, it was the bridge to total amnesia, is that there was a line that struck me. It was, he was, as they all are, unknown in secret. That's it. I don't know if you know this. But that is a direct quote from the Book of the Law. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, no so kidding. you were that. Yeah, so I was. That made me st- sit up in my chair. I was like, w- "What is the direct quote, well, William?" Do you um, have it's about here? the followers. So Th- Thelemites was the name Crowley gave to his followers. Thelema mm-hmm. Greek means will, right? So where Hubbard got theta from? My yeah, so it's a good point. So Thelema Phaeton. Uh, so the will was that. So the Thelemites, and then the Book of the Law which Crowley received in 1904, supposedly from some entity called AWAS, right. uh, who ends up being Satan or Lucifer. Or, uh, and also, wasn't he depicted as a gray alien, I think, if they, try, if they drew a Well, that was a different story. The gray alien is uh, from the elementary working that took place in New York in 1918, I believe. So it was after some magical ritual, and then he drew that. But in a separate... Crowley actually was trying to contact entities or extra dimensional beings probably as Hubbard was doing exactly right so these guys are all into this stuff and Hubbard I mean there's a lot of things I mean a lot of stories and a lot of crazy stuff that I, some of which I included in Children of the Beast but just the fact that that was re-quoted you can see that these you know there's a ideological heritage from Crowley going all the way through uh, at least in part in Dianax not the real I don't know if the real overt mind control, but if you look at all, all, almost all occult groups, there's the occult doctrines, and then there's some type of thing about controlling others, mind control, social control. So they're all, it's always about controlling other people yeah. and manipulating their minds through lies, deception, whatever. Um, and I see Scientology within that same kind of framework, that same kind of history. Well, you nailed it. Like you said, they're not the only one. It still blows my mind to this day. That, I mean, mind control, William, to me, is the most ridiculous, ludicrous, insane thing to try to actually do to somebody. Because you would have to have no connection to your fellow man. Actually, you really have to have no conscience to be a mind controller like Gottlieb or Hubbard. I mean, pick your poison, Hitler. It just goes on and on throughout history. I mean, thankfully, I don't think most of the human race is like that at all. They're just victims of it. They don't realize that there are, are people in this world that, unfortunately, they're very clever. They have this figured out, and they're absolutely willing to do it. Yeah. I couldn't. I mean, I would know everything to start a cult. I would know exactly how to do what Hubbard did. I could make a million dollars a in a couple of years, no problem. It's very easy. to. Man- I learned from a master on how to manipulate people. I don't have any desire to do that. It would never cross my mind. And I still don't get what, thank God I don't get. Because I don't get the attraction and like Hubbard fondling those materials. Like he was just yeah. static and into yeah. this. He just liked loved it. it. Anyway, yeah. I liked wanting to be an artist. I can't wrap my mind around people. And yeah, it's the like same stuff. Said, doing a bunch of drugs mentioned. and stuff. Like drugs like yeah, holy, to Open his consciousness. And, yeah. And William, what do you think that at the end of like Hubbard's life or Crowley's life or something, what do you think that these people conclude? Like, do you think that they go, oh, because I heard that at the end, Hubbard said, oh, once you confided to a friend, oh my God, I got it all wrong. I was wrong. And I, he was like a miserable man. But do you think these guys go out the Howard Hughes ways, man, where they have long fingernails and like Hubbard, the hair's all well, scraggly? That's what they you know, said about Hubbard. Insane. He was insane and he had long fingernails and ran room to room <laughs> yeah. giggling. That was supposedly how he he ended up. Yeah, Crowley that's, himself that's was a heavy duty more like a opium addict. He yeah. took drugs and he kind of I mean 
his magical name was Perduraba, which I will endure. So I think he really did endure to the end. And I think that, wow, that wow. these guys really go all the way. But I think yeah. it's really to, to be that much of a sociopath, I think you're really looking at it in spiritual terms that these people yeah. have the will to yeah. try to dominate their fellow man by any means necessary. So mind control, and it's really about self kind of deification, glorification. It's like uh, a narcissistic uh, endeavor. And then sometimes once they're in, they can't go back because they're addicted to the power and authority that they have other over other people. And it's the same theme within Hubbard, right. Hitler, Crowley. And they're always like, there's always this hier- hierarchy, right? So he, mm-hmm. all their structures, even Nazism, yeah. uh, you know, you have to go up these grades and you have certain things within the SS yeah. and then you get to the top. And all, yeah, so. Um, and of course they do that, William, to keep you from understanding what's happening because they right. compartmentalize everything and they give you bits of it's of information and it changes right. all along the way. So it's and the it's ultimate, inter- ultimate trap. Right. Yeah. And I think you actually mentioned that in one of your videos that one, once Hubbard got this tech, he actually fought against the people who told him the same materials they told Hitler. And Hitler did the same thing because once Hitler came to power, to. he made every other uh, cult order illegal. So it was just his cult was the Nazis. So all these other people were banned and kicked out. Steiner and all these other people. Yep. Anthrosophy. Yes. But it's interesting, there's a connection between Crowley and Hitler. So Crowley, when he was in the U.S., he worked for a guy named George Virek, B-I-E-R-E-C-K. Very close association, as a matter of fact. Their video was called The Fatherland, and Virek was one of the early, if not the earliest, interviewers of Adolf Hitler in 1923, even before he had written uh, Mein Kampf. So it was like 1923 or something, he interviewed him, and Hitler had the same positions. You can read it online. George Verrek, Adolf Hitler. So it's incredible that these guys are all, you know, maybe not super chummy, but there's definitely connections there. I think they're chummy up to a degree, but they also fight amongst each other because they all want to be superior. Right. But when it comes yeah. to the cause and the game yeah. and the taking over of the planet, I think yes. they kind of align to their, in, in, a, in a, these people are freaking crazy, but they're not dumb. Uh, it yeah, sucks yeah, that, that yeah, psychopathy. Yeah, Hubbard was not really dumb, high. but it, no, that Western. when you when you state that, it reminds me of that picture of Hubbard grabbing the world. That like scares there's, me. Remember man. that globe? I, he's I looking have a over in my skull. Yeah, and he's looking at it in uh, the creepiest way. Like this is mine. Dude, I'm really, totally. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean that could have been Hitler, right? I know, Absolutely, they all wanted world I domination like know. that. Can you imagine that kind of grandiose? I can't. I can't. Bro. Like That's that, what I'm man. still trying to kind of understand. Maybe I'm just still naive, but I don't. I still don't get it. Like you don't want to do that, right? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think that. Perfect. I'm not on You're that path. You're the man. opposite of that. I'm not on that path. I just do <laughs> simple interviews where I ask questions, <laughs> try to get an understanding. In a lot right. of ways, I'm a lot. I, I mean, I never went through Scientology, but I went through a system where I was not given all the information that I think I needed, you know, I think that what's, I really, what system? What system just like the edu- the public education system. Oh, yeah. I wasn't a part of a wealthy family. I didn't have any intelligence connections mm-hmm. in my family. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I didn't have access to people. My parents neither had a college degree. So I didn't ha- I had the kind of, I just was spoon fed all this information through mass media and all that stuff. And I, you know, there was a lot left out. Nobody told me, you know, as things yeah. about the occult influencing events, influencing uh, <laughs> culture, influencing societies, you know, massively. Too. Right. So I'd say Crowley. Left out. Yeah, Crowley. 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 Yeah, I keep yeah. missing his name because Ozzy Osbourne had that song burned in my mist or yeah. Crowley. It's Crowley, right? Crowley so, rhymes with Holy. He rhymed it with Holy in this poem called The Beetle. So, oh, very clever, man. You're not, you're like an encyclopedia, William. You know, he, um, I, I think that when I was coming to understand this stuff, I would say Crowley's influence is global, massive, and he's probably still today, he's probably one, one of the most influential people in the world that we live in, since at least, I mean, he got really popular in the 60s, and it just, it's, I think Hubbard wanted to be like him, and he would have been jealous, because even today, his influence is absolutely enormous and people would have no idea. Well, it's almost, general. yeah, it's almost like Hubbard knew from firsthand from yeah. being in the Agape Lodge and the problems yeah. that beset the OTO, financial problems and its popularity. 
And yep. he seemed to like tweak it because the Lima had elements in it that just weren't that popular. But like you said, in your right, own videos, right. I was raised in a secret society. So Crowley, I mean, Hubbard himself kind of refined Crowley's and made sure there was enough money so that they could perpetrate their goals. And I think that's really what the Hubbard added on to well said. OTL stuff. Yeah. So they, that's why Hubbard was so powerful and ruthless because he could prosecute any of any type or not really prosecute, but he could engage in any type of legal or extra legal behavior using all kinds of operatives to quash any enemy. And he had that same attitude that's in the book of the law, which is be at them, rip their heads off. Yeah. You know, triumph success is thy proof. And you see that same thing. Hitler repeated phrases that are very similar to Crowley or book of the law statements, which is really scary. Yep. All say Success the same is thy proof. Right? Power over everybody. I mean, yep. the the triumph of the will, right? So Crowley's yep. ideas of will, Philema, Hubbard, Thetan, Hitler, triumph of the will. You see the same theme, and you you can put it in a Christian context, which is, you know, Christ is always saying, "Thy, you know, our Father who art in heaven, let Thy will be done." Right. So it's all about God's right. will, and yeah, then there's that contradistinction with these other occultists it's always their will it's always them over everybody so whatever their peculiar issues are whatever you know they're always you know i think hitler was really using black magic to solve a lot of interior psychological problems that he had definitely same with well said man hubbard himself right he's a mike has mental issues right so he has kind of a mental history and here he comes into his own occult and what who's his primarily antagonist it's the psychiatric community is my, my right. It's a way out to have to deal with his own insecurities and issues. Exactly yeah, I right, so. man. I think so. I mean, because we know that, you know, about the Napoleon complex, that, I mean, these people, one of the things I learned about these Hubbards, they, they may seem like they're all powerful, but they're insecure little insecure, boys inside. Yeah, and yeah, that's like you right. said, that's why they do what they do, man. They found Hubbard and Crowley found a way out. Ooh, I got black magic. Ooh, now I know the occult. Ooh, now I know how to take over minds. I know about symbolism and stuff. Ooh, isn't this good? This this is a way where I don't have to deal with being thrown into a mental institution like they want to do with Hubbard. And so I can just create my own reality and my own will. I don't have to let go and let God. I can be God. And it was a what you're right. It's a way so true, out man. All their stuff, man. Right? You just Talk distilled it right from- into it. No, man. I really think that that's the commonality. And if yeah. something happens in their human personality or a male personality at a yeah. certain age, they're like, I'm not taking any crap anymore. I'm not, I'm going to be the one on top and I'm going to use black magic. I mean, you, you, uh, Damien Eccles, we can throw him in there. Yeah, same, right. I mean, same this, thing. This creep, man. I mean, geez, I mean, let's talk about an inverted world. He's out doing, he's like a rock star. I mean, Ooh, I'm a black magician. All right, cool. And I can, it got me out of jail. And I'll, what's the difference really between some, teenager that probably started out like Eccles and a teenager like Hubbard with the same insecurities, they stumble across this way out of dealing with themselves and they can just control everybody as a way out. But they're going to find out in the end, I think that it doesn't really work out that way. You know, but the the kind of the ruin and misery and yes, suffering they leave in their wake is not really calculable. It's not, it's incalculable. Yeah. It does it ever it never crosses their mind, obviously, that maybe this will catch up with me at some point. Maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Like you said, I you think you nailed it, man. The insecurities kick in as a young age. I'm not gonna be bullied anymore. I'm not gonna take any shit. I found this way to kind of manipulate people. I'm gonna go with it. And once you pop commit to that, there's no turning back at a certain point. You have to keep believing in it more and more and more. And that's probably how Hubbard both believed in it and also knew he was uh, conning people and snickering at him while he was showing them his tricks, you know? Yeah. I mean, don't you think like Hitler's doing the same thing in some of those like yes. big meetings he had where he's like, these, yes. I'm putting my ideas right into these people's brains in an environment where they lost critical thinking, like almost just standing up like a soldier in a big thing. Like you can't nudge your buddy and go, Hey, this guy, is he really for real? Like, do we believe his ideas? <laughs> No, you, exactly. your reactive mind is gone, right? Uh, reactive yes. mind's gone. I, He's saying, thinking. mind conf, screaming. And you're like, hey, whatever this guy says. And it's interesting because room 101, you see that kind of same kind of technique where you can't move in the TR and you can't ask mm-hmm. questions and you can't do There's a lot. I mean, a lot of cults, if not all cults, you do not ask questions. 
you do not critically think. It's right? so amazing to me, William, that it happened to me because I would have thought, as I said in one of the other videos, I would be the last person that would join a cult that wouldn't think critically or wouldn't question. That's my nature. But the fact that a lot of it had to do with the fact I was born into it and getting into it seed by seed, but it's amazing. It's amazing. It always makes me cackle when someone says, you're an idiot. I would never fall for that. Meanwhile, you know, they have no idea the world they actually live in. I mean, we all have our own belief systems, our own false self identities. I learned to never look at another person and go, what an idiot. Because once you have an experience like this and you think you can never be hoodwinked and you think you're the last person that could be hoodwinked, especially with something so ridiculous, it's not about being an idiot. It's about there's tools that you don't know about that you're not right. taught about in school purposely. And therefore, everybody's subject to them. Only someone who doesn't understand this would say something as ridiculous as, I'd never fall for that. That would never happen to me. As soon as I hear somebody say that, I know right away they don't know much about this world, seriously. And I don't mean that to be mean. I just mean that they haven't realized what, what they don't know yet. It's already happened to them. Well, you know? if you if using for an example, look at some of these political parties. Like I'm not affiliated mm -hmm. with the Republicans or the Democrats. Me but you can see the same kind of cult behavior in Absolutely. some of their stuff. Like I mean, if yeah, so of course, man, we and can get into nine eleven and all that stuff. But even like the left today has become the yes. authoritarian. I'm yep. going to put my ideas in your head. Exactly. There's no uh, arguing, no critical thinking, and exactly. Trump is bad. Orange man. Half exactly. Ginger Orange man bad. Yep. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's the same thing. Like instead of psych psychology, they've got their boogeyman. If it's not Osama bin Laden, it's Trump or whatever. Hammering like the left and some of these NPR and stuff, they're just they're propagandizing their own followers so intensely. Sometimes I'm shocked. You can make similarities between Scientology and modern political practice, at least Absolutely. in the United States. Absolutely. That's the point I was oh, making. Man. Someone who is acts just like you did will say, I'm not in a cult. What an right. idiot you are for fucking joining Scientology. Meanwhile, they're just as brainwashed. They're in their own fake belief system. Yes. And they're cackling at you thinking it would never happen. I mean, yeah. William, you, well, you would well, know. Well, just I mean, I grew up a Catholic. I grew up in the Catholic Church. And there's oh, a lot wow. of, yeah, a lot of deceptions and things they don't tell about. Yes. What's I mean, new? What, the Catholic Church has more blood on their hands and freaking pedophilia. Oh, I mean, you talk I mean about Scientology is going to take a while to catch up with the Catholic oh, Church. Yeah, bro. It's, it's bad. It's all about what you know when you know. And if you can go back and if you're probably the same as other ex-Scientologists is, I wish I would have known then what I know now. Of course, man. But then I've said that a million times, William. But then again, we... When I look at my own life, I wouldn't have learned what I needed to learn any other way. And that was just sort of the way to kind of get. I mean, you know, I was just going to say earlier, William, that I don't think anybody's really exempt when you get down to it from being under mind control because of the very society and the education system and our parents trying to be good, but they pass on their subconscious and their yeah. issues to us without meaning to. There's, there's a whole thing going on so here. So true. So, true. so don't we all have to kind of at some point maybe yes. have a midlife crisis and question things and kind of break down our beliefs? You know, I feel lucky that that happened to me. That was the extremity that it took to boot me out of just going along. So I'm thankful for that, man. I mean, I got a lot out of it. And maybe it took something like Scientology to initiate that process. If it didn't come into my life, I don't know if I would have fallen into the areas of interest and discovery that I did if I didn't meet a master um, evil person. So I don't condone Scientology or any of the other religions and control systems that we have. They should have been gone a long time ago. But at the same time, if we're born into a world that's pretty, um, lack of a better word, controlled, we do have to go through, as Carl Jung would say, the individuation process. We have to break away from the group. We have to find out who we are. And Scientology was a forced, I was forced to do that. It's not something I realize anybody, myself included, would do naturally. But that opportunity was a do or die. So it, I got a lot out of both being under mind control and then especially getting out of it. It taught me what we're talking about here today. And I'm sure you'd say the same thing if you look back at your life in some fashion, right? I think so. But I mean, one of the interesting things about you and a lot of the ex-Scientologists is you guys become experts in mind control. You know all the techniques. You don't use really? them. Well, I, don't you think? I mean, there's well, I think you're absolutely right, but yeah. you don't think that you wouldn't say that you're an expert in mind control too. So do you think it's particular to Scientologists because we get obsessed with like how the trick was done? Or do you think a lot of people coming out of a belief system do that? 
I think they come out of a belief system they do that. But I think Scientology is unique because there's so much focus on the mind and like yes. that's their pre pretenses that we're restructuring your ability to think, I think, and make you a better person. I mean, I guess right. I don't, there's definitely an overlap between coercive religious spirituality, maybe, or spirituality mm-hmm. and Scientology. There's some disturbing overlaps, no question. It may not be as overt. I mean, the thing is, we can get this into this in another conversation, but when you get, as you know, you get up to those higher OT levels, things get really scary. I would be, oh, I would man. say really scary for the thing that you don't really get in those like uh, maybe traditional Christian religions or interesting. Some, you know, I would say, because like, if you go for, let's say you go to the top of the Catholic church as a lay person, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You just become like a church goer. The priest is the guy with the authority um, or you get to the top of Lutheranism, but you get to the top of uh, Scientology, you're getting touched with something else. So, I mean, I think, so I don't think it's different. I definitely think Scientology or other mind control cults are definitely unique in that regard. I'm glad that you said that, William, because, you know, I asked you when we first talked the other day, like, I am, I was a Scientologist my whole life. And so I recognize other patterns of control and maybe I have them boxed up as, hey, they're all the same, but you're right. And I, since I only know Scientology, I do know that it has some of the most comprehensive package of mind control in one place that makes it unique. It's interesting always hearing an outsider, someone who's not a Scientologist, remind me of that because I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, what, what you said re-stimulated me, as they say in Scientology, about the OT levels. Those OT levels, I get up to OT3, the infamous Zenu, Zenu thing, and I literally had a nervous breakdown outside of AOLA in Los Angeles, thinking, screaming, they're going to get me, they're all over me. I, I couldn't sleep at night because I felt these beings communicating to me. My belief in this was so strong that it drove me absolutely insane. And it's taken with the PTSD that you're talking about earlier, at least 10 years to undo that. And I've even heard it said that Scientology has the longest recovery process or one of the longer ones when, when you come out of a cult. So maybe you're right. It's not all at the same level. Yeah, I don't I think, think it's, no, I think Scientology is, is unique because the, the, these other... I mean, at least, I mean, I I can't speak as an expert, but I think that Scientology has that element of black magic in there where you're talking about spirit and spirit possession that the Catholic church or some of these, I mean, what is it? There's probably four or five main churches, Orthodox, Mm -hmm. Catholic, um, Protestant, Lutheranism. Yeah, I just, I think that Scientology is unique because when you get up, that's when the, re- it's like, you think the coercion's bad. Once you get to the OT levels, you're into the space opera, but also that you have to keep doing that process to get these beings out of your body, right? Oh, man, like, gosh, you really hit me here, William, because. Isn't that is true? Something that's completely true. And there is something special and unique about Scientology. And Hubbard talked about this and it's what Hubbard's son did. You know, I, when I was talking about that weird, disgusting feeling that I had on me my whole life, because Scientology was just in my family, even before I took to it, and then I don't have that anymore. I think that, that there is something to the possession aspect, because Hubbard talked about those levels were specifically designed to crack a person's mind into a thousand pieces like Humpty Dumpty. And you know all about MP Ultra mind control, and how right. you can split the mind into different personalities and all that. And your listeners, I mean, they'll be up to speed on that, right? So there is a way to kind of, um, and L. Ron Hubbard was an expert in it, in Scientology in particular, about doing something quite bizarre to your actual spirit. Like, I felt like it took my soul when I was recovering from this. I felt like I was trying to get something back, but I didn't know I'd ever be able to get back. And William, I'm not even really a believer or anything. I, I just kind of got into Scientology, I think, for my ambitions and my goals, and because I thought I was going for spiritual freedom but it's a very narcissistic a lot of spirituality in it while you're pretending to be spiritual so this process kind of accidentally made me spiritual because i could tell that something really deep and dark actually happened to me and i think that also ties into that aspect that you're talking about about maybe the other religions don't go for full-on mind control and maybe even what you call possession because hubbard definitely felt like he was sucking the soul from another person through him and up to satan which he also thought he was I'm going to talk more about that in some of the videos because he, as we talked about, was into black magic when he was young. He had a pretty good understanding of what he believed he was doing. And it's really dark. 
And I believe that some of what he's talking about, he was crazy and he would see it a different way than I do, but there's definitely something to being able to take over a person at a level that might be really, really shocking and might make you a believer in spiritual reality, whereas you might not be before without this experience. That's one of the other benefits that I felt like. It made me, I thought Scientology was the truth. And since I found out it wasn't the truth, all of a sudden it made me want to know the truth, whatever it is, more passionately than ever when I was a Scientologist. So just by being burned so hard, he made me into a a really wanting to know what the, the truth is. And I wasn't really a seeker like that in Scientology. But something really heavy happens because you're working up this level and then really intense consequences like, you're not alone. I've heard other stories, people, of people freaking out because like I'm, I'm demon, I'm possessed by Thetans or other entities. Thetans, you mean? Well, whatever, Thetans or something. Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't the, know what the terminology is. Was a, if you, it's a famous thing in Scientology. If you say Thetan with a lisp, it's Satan. And that wasn't okay, an gotcha. accident either, by the way. Sorry. Interesting. But I remember a story. There was a, a really bad accident of a pilot in, and this may not be the truth, but the pilot went down in Washington, D.C., and he had just gone through operating Phaeton 3, and he was freaked out. And, like, he wasn't, he wasn't capable of doing his job. And I, I remember that story is, like, once these people supposedly get this realization or whatever, they're not better off. They're in a terrible state, like a terrible psychological, spiritual state. So, I mean, oh, you've, I think that Scientologists really at the very top have encountered really hardcore, super dark, you know, satanic experiences that with maybe not even knowing it i included something in children of the beast of some girl telling a story where hubbard got into her room i mean this gets graphic he like got on top of her while she was naked and yeah inserted his flaccid penis into her and stared her in the eyes for an hour he was possessing her soul he was trying to take her soul and he believes in this stuff and i'm telling you whatever he was doing he was had some knowledge in it And it affected me in a way where I think it's a mistake for ex-Scientologists and in general only to take it so far and dismiss the occult aspect of Scientology because I found out that's where the real control and the hold and the bonding power really is. So like I said, I'm not a believer necessarily in black magic. I don't believe in all these stupid spells that these guys are doing, but I know that they know something that the average person doesn't know that needs to get hip to, at least to understand what these people are doing. Cause I had something happen to me, like you said, that I didn't even know was real or possible, William, but it freaking happened. And we were talking earlier also about, you said, Hey, only an, only a Scientologist really know or talk about what it's about, but we come out of Scientology all jacked up. So, and maybe we were not, healed or whatever so only a scientologist or whatever could really talk about what we're talking about right now because unless i experienced going up to those ot levels and what happened to me spiritually without even being a believer i wouldn't be a believer man and i wouldn't have um i would have just dismissed the occult and hubbard's and crowley stuff is kind of a footnote and stupid and let's focus on the abuses and everything else. I think it's really important to at least get into what these people were into, not to become a black magician yourself. Understand right, if understand. you really want to know about how the mind works, if you really want to know about the subconscious, which Alan Hubbard called the reactive mind, um, if you really want to know about those things, you're not going to learn through Scientology or whatever. You're going to learn them by getting out, by reverse engineering it all. Right. I mean, I think that that's your, that's the commonality of all ex-Scientologists is they're reverse engineering what actually happened to them. They don't know the totality of it. But I think maybe the similarity of people like you is that you're in a secret society, like you said. So maybe it's similar to like weird things that happens in secret societies where people become bonded to that special group. So like they definitely, like if you look at the process church, which is a Scientology offshoot, they are definitely bonding themselves and there's, entities and yes even really so yeah so that may be the real similarity of people like you but they're not conscious in the front of their mind that they're in it so somebody else is kind of puppeteering and maybe that's the same thing as other people in process church or some other dark organization like that but Mm -hmm. it's almost like when you're in scientology you're you're not winning to the whole totality like you're going through a series of portals or 
curtains to see something else. And then people get to the end. I'm like, this is it. This guy's Lucifer. And, uh, and you know, the interesting thing about Scientology, which I, once I started reading their stuff, I, is how anti-Christian Hubbard oh, yeah. was. He's really oh, super yeah. anti-Christian, called Christ a pedophile and writing yes. just all of this. And that's very similar to Crowley, who like yep. couldn't insult Perfect. Christianity anymore. So you see this, and yes. Hitler, and we can just go on and on. You got me thinking from the earlier part of this conversation that that must be what it is, right? Why are they so against God? Why are they so, you know, I was thinking that they're such narcissists. They're so traumatized and insecure inside, and they need to have that power. That of course, they're going to be against, quote unquote, God, because that means you have to let go and sort of serve, not your ego, but you have to let life flow with it. And you have to align with the truth, not make it what you want it to be. And these people can't deal with that. And it's hard to deal with life as it really is, because you. I found out you do have to let go. I don't feel, it's paradoxical that I don't feel... Like I'm, I had that soul that I had when I was a Scientologist, but by letting go, I feel more in control than ever. If that makes any sense, it's a paradox, but I'm just saying <sighs> these guys are holding on so hard and no wonder they're against God because that would be relinquishing your ego. Right, and yes. you, like I said, you go have to go where the truth takes you, not what you freaking want it to be. And these guys are like, you create your own reality. I say how it is. I don't have to deal with my issues and this black magic and occult stuff is the way out of this. And it's just such a, if only they knew what they, like, what a stupid, like, as intelligent as they are, what a very unaware and stupid, nonsensical way to go about living your life. Like, you're guaranteed to set yourself up for loss. You're going to have to lie your whole life. You're going to have to be a fake person. And you're going to have to keep building and building and building that lie. And we all know how it turns out with Howard Hughes, Hubbard, Hitler. They all turn out the same way. So it's like these idiots, as intelligent as they are, and as manipulative as Machiavellian is they think they are really at their core very stupid people in my opinion. And the, like I said, the amount of ruin, I think that's a great point. And also it's the commonality, the original temptation in the garden. You shall be as gods. And all of those yes. people thought of themselves as gods. So yes. there's no God but man. Hitler is apotheosis. Yeah. He thought he was a god man, Ubermensch. Yeah. Hitler, Crow, yeah. You see that same theme in Scientology it's to be above all that. Control. I have control over matter, energy, space, and time. People, and, time. Yeah, and, and then, and like, you can counter or oppose that to Christianity, which is your will, your vengeance. It's really profound, man. So, yeah, yeah man. It's the kind of ruin that they did. Well, I'd love to have you back on, man. It was a great conversation. Oh, I mean, I mean the information's I mean, good. I highly, highly, highly recommend people check out your YouTube channel and go through all the videos that you have because they're just really informative. Like I said, you're you're telling about your personal story, but also the details and specifics of Scientology. And so that's really, you have real first person knowledge. I think it's so important for people to take a look at. The name of the YouTube channel is Dazed But Not Confused. It's confused spelled with a Z. So C-O-N-F-U-Z-E-D, Doug Kramer. Doug, is there anything else you'd like to share or anything else I missed or anything else other? I think you had some contact information if people want to send you an email on the show notes of each one of your videos so they can reach out yeah. and, and see what you're up to. If they have any questions about this conversation as well, but I'd love to have you back on and talk more in detail. Kind of, we only got through the very beginnings of stuff, but. Uh, I just wanted to say you covered all the contact information. It's really an honor to meet you and to have you invite me on here. I, I thought this conversation was mind blowing. I thought we were 10 minutes deep. Just want to say thank you very much, man. I look awesome. up to you and I really appreciate you having me on. Here. Well, I look up to you, man, because it takes a lot of courage to come out with the stuff. And I think like we spoke offline off of uh, recording, it's like you're allowing people to go through this process with you, painful process and, Hopefully they, they won't be the ones who went in without that kind of knowledge of what's really going on in Scientology. So yeah. I definitely credit you for uh, helping that out and getting this information out there. So thank you thank so you. much again. It's Doug Kramer, Kramer with a K, K-R-A-M-E-R, Dazed But Not Confused on YouTube. Thanks so much. Thank you, Will.